title of this talk is uh, Ethical Assumptions of Economics, or Economics and Its Ethical Assumptions. You might think, wait a second, uh, isn't uh, the, um, uh, the official Misesian position supposed to be that economics is value-free, uh, wertfrei, uh, or that economic value is subjective, and so that would seem to imply that economics has no ethical assumptions. And yet here I am lecturing on the ethical assumptions of economics. Well, I didn't pick this title. I was told to lecture on this subject. So uh, I've got to, you know, certainly got to act as though uh, ethics must have some ethical assumptions. Well, Mises and Rothbard both, uh, you know, both agreed that economic value is subjective and that economics is verify, but they had some disagreements about exactly what the implications of that were. Um, and... Uh, so I'm going to talk about senses and w different senses of being value-free or value-subjective and uh, in what sense economics is and what sense it might not be. Uh, one point that Rothbard sometimes points out is that there's at least a, a certain way that uh, economic terminology is sometimes used that isn't quite as verified as it seems to be. Uh, when... Um, you know, when economists talk freely about things like welfare and property and so forth, well, those terms, you know, can easily have a loaded value meaning. Uh, when you say something is someone's property, you know, do you mean it's their legitimate property? Uh, talk about someone's welfare, do you mean it makes them genuinely uh, better off or not? So there's that kind of uh, issue. And um, uh, there's a famous exchange in, uh, in uh, some of the Platonic dialogues where... Socrates analyzes concepts like, like wealth and profit and so forth. And Socrates asks his interlocutor, uh, you know, what counts as profit? And the first definition the interlocutor is, is uh, tempted to give is, well, a profit is when you get, more, you, know, you get more out of a transaction than you put into it. And so uh, uh, Socrates says, and I'll translate his example into our currency, he says, so uh, if I give you uh, you know, if you give me ten dollars, uh, if you give me a ten dollar bill, and I give you three one dollar bills, then you gave me one thing, and I gave you three things back. And doesn't that uh, does that mean you profited because you got more back than you gave? And so the guy says, No, no, it has to be the things you get back. I can't be just sort of greater quantity; they have to be greater value. And then Socrates says, Aha! So nothing really counts as a profit unless it's really more valuable. And so therefore. Uh, you don't really count as having profited unless you get something that's genuinely, objectively more valuable. Well, Mises wouldn't like that argument. He'd say, well, you know, all that matters is that it be more valuable to you, uh, not that it be uh, more valuable objectively. But that you know, gets us into some of the uh, questions we're going to look at here. Now, the, uh, when we talk about economic value being subjective, we have to distinguish between two different things that could mean. On the one hand, you could talk about explanatory value subjectivism, which is to say this, that when I'm going to explaining someone's action, explaining why they do something, I have to explain it in terms of their values, not mine. Uh, so if someone, uh, if someone chooses the Brussels sprout flavor ice cream over uh, the chocolate flavor ice cream, if I try to explain that in terms of my values, well, I've got normal, sensible values, and so I wouldn't be able to explain it. I'd, but I'd have to explain it in terms of this person preferring that. So when you're going to explain someone's actions, you have to explain it in terms of the world as they see it, their beliefs, their desires, their values, uh, not your own. So in that sense, uh, economics deals with subjective value in the sense that it explains actions in terms of the values held by the actors you're trying to explain. Uh, and it's value-free in the sense that you don't have to agree or disagree with their values. You, you know, the question of whether you agree or disagree with their values isn't relevant to explaining uh, why they did what they did. Uh, but there's also such a thing as normative value subjectivism. Normative value subjectivism is the view that there's really nothing to be said for one value over another. That just some people prefer one and some people prefer another, but there's no such thing as being right or wrong in your values. Your values just are whatever they are. And there's no standpoint from which you can criticize someone else's values. You can criticize someone else's means on the grounds that, that those means really won't help them achieve their ends, but you can't, on this view, criticize their ends. Uh, they just have their ends. Uh, now, Mises seems to have accepted both those kinds 
of value subjectivism. Uh, Mises thought not only that we have to, you know, we have to rely on the person's ends, not our own, in explaining their action, but also we have to rely on the person's ends, not our own, in evaluating the action. Uh, and Mises thought it was the height of presumption to criticize someone else's goals. Uh, but of course, you know, if I feel like crit criticizing someone else's goals, then criticizing someone else's goals is part of my, was one of my ends. And so I guess you know, it's not clear why Mises it isn't the height of presumption for Mises to call it the height of presumption for me, except that calling it the height of presumption was you know, his highest end at the moment. Uh, anyway, so Mises uh, accepts both kinds of value subjectivism and seems to think that they're connected. And I'll talk in a bit about why. I, I don't think that, that Mises just confused these two. I, thought, I think Mises thought that there was an important reason why, if you're an explanatory value subjectivist, that someone commits you to normative value subjectivism. Uh, Rothbard, as we'll see, you know, agrees with the explanatory value subjectivism, but not so much with the, the normative one. Uh, so uh, this gets us to the question, what can praxeology do in the way of giving advice? And praxeology you know, describes how, you know, how action works and so forth. But is there any sense in which praxeology can give us advice, can advise us what to do? Well, Mises said yes. Mises thought praxeology couldn't criticize our ends, but it could criticize our means. Uh, praxeology can show us that if we value things like prosperity and social cooperation and so on, then, well, then we can be shown that well, interventionist government policies are going to be bad means to those ends, that those, that those are means that will fail uh, by our own standards. Uh, so if, in fact, we value things like, like social cooperation and prosperity and human life, uh, then Praxeology can show us that we need things like property rights and peace and free exchange and so forth um, as ways of achieving those goals. But if someone, according to Mises, if someone happens not to want those things, if someone says, eh, I prefer war and conflict, even it means a short and bloody life as long as it's a glorious one, if they have sort of Klingon values, uh, then, uh, you know, Mises has nothing to say about that. Now, I always wondered about the Klingons. I mean, the Klingons have, you know, they developed space travel, you know, so there must have been some people in Klingon society who were, weren't just, you know, battling all the time. Uh, people are actually, you know, trying to figure out principles of physics and chemistry and astronomy, and we never meet those Klingons, but they must be out there. Uh, but, um, you know, so Mises thinks that as long as someone has certain goals, uh, yeah, and he thinks that most people share goals of, of prosperity and social cooperation and so on, uh, then we can give, Praxeology can give them advice by telling them what the best means are, but if you, if you happen not to have those goals, then Praxeology's got nothing to say for them. Uh, Rothbard goes a step farther. Uh, in the last chapter of Power and Market, a chapter called uh, anti-market ethics. Rothbard suggests a way in which uh, praxeology can criticize not just means but ends. The way it can do it is by showing that certain ends are impossible or incoherent. Showing in, pra in praxeological terms. If there are certain goals that simply for praxeological reasons cannot be achieved or do not make any sense, if you can show that on the basis of praxeology, then you've successfully criticized not just, uh, you know, not just a means, uh, but an end. So in that sense, Rothbard thought that praxeology could be extended to the criticism uh, of ends. But that's a kind of a purely negative function. It cannot, uh, in, that, in that sense, he's not recommending any positive ends for us, but simply ruling out some negative ones. Now, Rothbard did, in fact, think that you could give some positive ethical advice, but he doesn't seem to have thought that it was on the basis of praxeology exactly that he did it. Uh, in his book, uh, The Ethics of Liberty, he sets out uh, you know, some positive ethical principles. And you could regard his arguments for them as you know, being sort of in a broadly praxeological style. And if you do, then you could say, well, in that sense, then Rothbard is, is grounding uh, ethics and praxeology too, but at least he doesn't explicitly say that he's doing that. He thinks you're going beyond praxeology to moral philosophy, it seems, when you 
do that. Um, but then the question is, does praxeology have any implications? Uh, to what extent does it have any implications for positive ethical theorizing? To what extent can it actually recommend some ends as ends we ought to adopt or show that we're somewhat committed to adopting them? Or something like that. Well, this brings me to a dispute that was referred to in one of the earlier lectures, a dispute between Menger and Mises on the concept of imaginary goods. Uh, Menger thought that in order for something to be a good, uh, it had to, you, know, you needed first, there had to be a human need, and second, this thing had to be suited to fulfill that need. And there were some other requirements too. You had to know that it did, and you had to have command of it sufficient to direct it to the need. But anyway, two of the crucial requirements for something being a good are A, there has to be a genuine human need, and B, this thing really has to be suited to meeting that need. And if either of those two conditions fail, then, says Menger, it's an imaginary good. Uh, it's an imaginary good if either it doesn't, really, it, it, it doesn't really have the properties necessary to meet the need, or if the need is somehow a bogus need. Uh, and Menger thought that both of those were ways that, that, uh, that something could fail to be a genuine good. Uh, you know, so, for example, uh, let's say there's some potion that I think will cure my disease, but in fact it, it won't. It's just, you know, water and sugar. Uh, then curing my disease might be a genuine human need, but this thing isn't really suited to meet it. And so it's, uh, you know, it's an imaginary good. Or, suppose it really is suited to meet some desire of mine, but this desire of mine isn't a genuine human need. Um, it's just something I happen to want for some frivolous reason. And Menger, at some point, suggested cosmetics are imaginary goods, because although they may, in fact, fulfill this want, this want isn't a genuine human need. Now, Mises thought that this, that this distinction was disastrous. Mises thought, look, uh, first of all, you don't need uh, this concept of imaginary goods in order to explain anything in economics. In economics, what we're trying to do is explain why people do what they do, and all, all you need to explain it is their belief that this will meet a genuine you know, need that they have. And whether, they, whether it actually will or not, or whether the need is an actual need or not, whatever that means, is completely irrelevant to economics, Mises thought. But Mises thought it's not just irrelevant to economics, he also thought it was just irrelevant, period. He thought that there's simply no such thing as there being a genuine, uh, something's being a genuine human need or not. You know, so he said, yeah, it is possible to make mistakes about means. You can make a mistake about whether something really uh, fulfills your goals or not. But you can't make a mistake about your goals. You know, the only way you can evaluate something is whether it, it suits your goals or not. And so you can't evaluate the goals themselves. Mises thought. So Mises thought that Menger's distinction wasn't just econo economically irrelevant, but it was somehow philosophically confused as well. Only errors about means are possible. You can't make errors about ends. Now, one thing that gets tricky about evaluating this dispute is that there's a distinction that often isn't drawn between two different ways that something could be a means to an end. And philosophers sometimes call this a distinction between instrumental means to an end and constitutive means to an end. And the difference is an instrumental means to an end is one that's somehow external to the end. It's separate, it's not, the, it's not part of the end, it's something separate to it that leads to it. You know, so for example, suppose I have the goal of going and looking through uh, Rothbard's correspondence, which is actually a fairly enjoyable thing to do. Um, well, it's on the third floor, and so I would have to take the means of walking up the stairs to the third floor in order to do it. So my goal is to to look at Rothbard's correspondence, my means is heading up the stairs. In that case, heading up the stairs is an instrumental means to my goal. It's, a, it's not part of the goal. Going upstairs isn't, isn't part of uh, reading Rothbard's correspondence. It's just a, uh, you know, sort of a tool for getting there. But there are also cases where uh, a means is actually part of the end. Suppose, for example, that my goal is to play the Moonlight Sonata. And there are various things that would be means to doing that, you know, buying a piano or taking piano lessons and so forth. Those would be instrumental means. But suppose that here I am playing the Moonlight Sonata, and at a particular point I play a particular note. 
And you ask me, why did I play that note? And I'll say, well, because that note comes at that point in the Moonlight Sonata and I want to play the Moonlight Sonata. Well, in that sense then, I'm not really playing the note for its own sake. It's not that I just find that note all by itself to be so pleasant. But rather, I'm playing that note because you have to play that note in order to play the Moonlight Sonata. So in that sense, playing the note is a means to playing the Moonlight Sonata. But it's different from the other kinds of means in that it's a part of the goal. You value it because of its contribution to the whole thing, but it's not a causal contribution exactly. Um, it's not an instrumentally causal, causal contribution. It's actually part of the whole thing. And you can tell the difference because in the case of instrumental means, it always makes sense to say, you know, I wish I could have the goal without having to go through this means. You know, I wish I could just be up there reading Rothbard's correspondence without having to trudge up the stairs. Or I wish I could be playing the Moonlight Sonata without having to go to the expense of buying a piano and playing for piano lessons and so on. But it doesn't make sense to say, I wish I could play the, piano, the Moonlight Sonata without having to play all these notes. Because the Moonlight Sonata just is those notes in that order. And that's what it is. Um, so, uh, when people say that you can only evaluate means and not ends, exactly what we should make of that depends on whether, uh, on exactly what it means to evaluate an end. You know, Aristotle, for example, often says, you know, we cannot deliberate about ends, only about means. And yet, Aristotle also talks about, you know, trying to figure out what ends to follow. But it turns out what Aristotle means by the sense in which you can deliberate about an end is you can deliberate about the constitutive means to it. In other words, in other words you can deliberate not just about causally, how can I bring about this goal, but you can try and think more clearly about what the constituents of the goal really are. You can try and figure out what your sort of your vaguely grasped goal really amounts to in practice. So does that count as, you know, so when you make your goal more specific by figuring out what its content is, what its constitutive means are, are you deliberating about ends or are you really just deliberating about means? Well, you know, it's sort of a terminological question there. Um, and uh, it might be that you can deliberate about ends in the sense that you can deliberate not just about instrumental but constitutive means to your ultimate ends even if you can't deliberate about the ultimate end as such. Now, uh, there are two claims that Mises makes. Uh, again, I, I'm not using his terminology. He doesn't uh, draw this terminological distinction. But uh, Mises seems to make both of these claims, and I think that Rothbard would deny both of them. One is that explanatory value subjectivism implies normative value subjectivism. Uh, you know, again, you know, Mises doesn't put it precisely that way because Mises doesn't use this terminology, but Mises seems to think that once you grant this idea that the economist should simply explain things in terms of the ends that the person has, that you're somehow thereby committed to never criticizing ends, that never makes sense to criticize uh, ends. And he also thinks that this in turn implies something he calls utilitarianism. Now, by utilitarianism, I think he means something a little bit different from what most moral philosophers mean by it. Uh, you know, since, uh, for most m moral philosophers, utilitarianism is a particular ethical theory. And so it's not compatible, most philosophers would think, with, with being a normative value subjectivist. A normative value subjectivist is someone who thinks that, that uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to talk about any ethical theories being true or false or any ends being right or wrong. Whereas most utilitarians think yeah, there is an ethical theory that's true, it's utilitarianism. There is a genuine end that's right, namely, you know, total human welfare, or something like that. Uh, and so, mo for most moral philosophers, utilitarianism is a moral theory that recommends as the end to be pursued overall human welfare. Uh, and then, you know, individual actions are chosen by, according to whether that action promotes human welfare or whether that action accords with a rule that promotes human welfare or whichever flavor of utilitarianism you go for. But that's not quite what Mises means by utilitarianism. Uh, Mises doesn't mean a particular theory about what is objectively good. Uh, Mises means that you start off uh, with the ends people actually have and uh, all you do in the way of giving advice is give them advice about the means to attain their ends. It's just that Mises thinks that the overwhelming majority of people 
have in common, even if they disagree about all kinds of particular ends, have in common certain very general ends. Things like social cooperation, peace, prosperity, uh, and things like that. And since most people share those goals, then what Mises does in the way of giving advice is to say, look, here's how you can achieve those goals. Um, and when people adopt mistaken policies for achieving those goals, Mises thinks, well, I can show you that in fact, you know, this government measure that you've introduced in order to promote peace and prosperity will actually promote conflict and poverty, and so therefore, given your goals, you should give it up. So this version of utilitarianism really has nothing to say to the person who says, I seek human misery. Uh, you know, if that's what you seek, you know, Mises' version of utilitarianism has nothing to say to you except, you know, too bad about you. We, we may have to restrain you at some point. Um, okay, so why does Mises think that uh, explanatory value subjectivism implies normative value subjectivism? Well, here I think is the money quote. Uh, he says, all non-utilitarian systems of ethics, and you know, again, he's using utilitarian and non-utilitarian the way I just explained, to mean, uh, for him, a utilitarian system of ethics is one that gives you advice about how to achieve those goals you already actually have. Whereas a non-utilitarian system of ethics is one that tries to advise you what goals you ought to have. All non-utilitarian systems of ethics look upon the moral law as something outside the nexus of means and ends. The moral code has no reference to human well-being and happiness, to expediency, and to the mundane striving after ends. It is Hieronymus, that is, enjoined upon man by an agency that does not depend on human ideas and does not bother about human concerns. Now, he's being, I think, a bit playful in using the term heteronymous here. Uh, heteronymous is the opposite of autonomous. Autonomous means being governed by a law you give to yourself, uh, autonomous, self-lawed. Uh, heteronymous means being governed by a law that comes from without. Uh, and uh, the ethical use of this term comes from Kant, who uses uh, autonomy to mean cases where we are being governed by these imperatives that arise from the nature of our own reason. And heteronomy is when we're merely being governed by our desires. Uh, so. Mises is sort of turning this concept on his head. He's using, uh, he's saying that, you know, you're really only autonomous when you are, you know, pursuing your own desires. And heteronomy would be when, you know, some ethical system comes along and tells you to do something different from what you desire. Uh, so I think this, this passage captures, I think, why he thinks there's something wrong with, uh, with rejecting normative value subjectivism. He says, look, if we grant that people you know, that action is always a matter of applying means to ends, then it doesn't make any sense to advise someone to, do, to pursue some end different from the one they have. You can try to show them that the means they're pursuing to their ends don't work and they should pick different ends, I mean different means. But it doesn't make any sense to tell them to pick different ends because action just is. Action isn't the selection of ends. Action is the application of means to uh, existing ends. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, it doesn't make any sense to uh, tell people to switch their, their hands. Well, uh, what does uh, this principle actually imply? Well, there's something called ethical internalism, which is the view that you can't have a moral duty to do something unless you have some kind of motivational ground for doing it. It doesn't make any sense to say you have an obligation to do X if you have no motivation whatsoever to do X. And the principle will basically be the principle of ought implies can. It doesn't make any sense to demand of you that you do something you can't do. It wouldn't make any sense to say you are obligated to flap your arms and fly to the ceiling right now. Uh, it couldn't be a moral duty because it can't be a moral duty unless it's something you're able to do. Well, if you think that all action involves the application of means to ends, it doesn't make any sense to say that you have a duty to do something, you know, to pursue some end you don't have. In some sense, you can't pursue an end you don't have. Action just is the application of means to whatever your ends are. And if you don't have an end, then you cannot act for it. Um, now, it's easy to see why someone might think that, if, that, that uh, ethical internalism in turn implies value subjectivism, but it doesn't necessarily. Uh, because 
it might be that there are certain considerations that can cause you to acquire some motivation you didn't have before. So it might be that rather than the duty waiting for you to, uh, you know, to have the motivation, explaining the duty to you might cause you to have the motivation, in which case internalism would be satisfied. Or it might be that what I can do is show you that uh, some end you already have is different in its nature from what you thought, and so its constitutive means are different. So the various uh, kinds of moral advice that might be consistent with ethical internalism. Uh, and again, uh, once we keep this distinction between instrumental and constitutive means in mind, it becomes possible that uh, that certain kinds of moral action we valued not because of their causal consequences, but because those forms of moral action are actually part of the end. And this is what we find uh, actually in sort of the first 2,000 years of Western moral philosophy. Uh, Plato and Aristotle, the Stoics, the Scholastics, all these people generally held that we, we have a general goal, happiness. But they did, by happiness, they didn't mean a mental state. They meant something like successful human living. And morality isn't a means to, isn't an instrumental means to it, it's a constitutive means to it, it's part of it. But they thought that they could show that this goal that you already have actually has morality as one of its components. Now, uh, a few years ago, uh, Leland Jaeger, who's uh, a semi-Austrian uh, economist, uh, came up with a book called Ethics as Social Science, in which he argues for a Mises-style version of utilitarianism. It's not precisely like Mises, but it's sort of broadly similar to Mises' uh, version of utilitarianism. And here's Jaeger's argument, or his main argument. He says, look, uh, ends are arbitrary. You can't argue for or against ends. You can argue for or against means on the basis of whether uh, something serves a given end or not. Therefore, any ethical system is going to have some arbitrariness in it. But surely we want to have the least amount of arbitrariness, and we want the arbitrariness to come in the least controversial place. So we make one value assumption, namely human happiness is good. And Jaeger says it doesn't matter whether we say it's the ha happiness of, well, of, of society as a whole or whether it's just your own individual happiness. He thinks that it doesn't matter whether you're a, you know, a universalist, utilitarian, or whether you're an egoist, because he thinks that they end up impl implying each other. Um, sort of as, as Herbert Spencer did. But he says, we make this one assumption, and although it's arbitrary, and since it's not defended, it's not controversial. Most people think happiness, their own or everyone's or both, is, is a good thing. So we take that as our one arbitrary assumption, and then uh, everything else is justified as uh, a means to it. Whereas, if you're not a utilitarian, if you think that there are you know, things like intrinsic moral rights, uh, or intrinsic moral duties, various things that are binding on us regardless of whether they promote human happiness or not, then you're increasing the number of arbitrary values in the system. And uh, you know, since arbitrariness is a bad thing, we don't want, you know, we want as little of it as possible. We can't have an ethical system that doesn't have some, but we don't want all, so much of it. And so rather than saying happiness is good and so is, and rights, respecting rights is also inherently good, and following this moral principle and that one and that one, all these things are inherently good. He uh, says, well, no, so, since you can't prove that anything is inherently good, the more things you say are inherently good, the more things you're making arbitrary in your system. So the least arbitrary system, says Jaeger, is just to declare one thing as inherently good, human happiness, and although you can't prove it, at least it's a lot less controversial than these other ones. And then you justify everything else uh, in terms of it. Well, I have a couple of worries about this. Uh, one is that it's not really clear to me that uh, you know, if we grant his assumption that, that any inherent value has to be arbitrary, it's not really clear that, that having a whole system rest on one arbitrary assumption and having a whole system rest on multiple arbitrary assumptions, that one of those is really more arbitrariness than the other. It seems that if everything ultimately rests on an arbitrary assumption, it seems like the whole thing is arbitrary. Um, it doesn't seem to matter how, whether it's all resting on one or all resting on many, just as uh, if, you, um, uh, you know, if you are uh, you know, 
just as if you were resting something on something false, it wouldn't seem to matter if it was resting on one false assumption or on many. But also, of course, I don't agree that there's no way of, uh, of assessing uh, inherent moral values. Uh, I would say that uh, there's what uh, sometimes in philosophy called reflective equilibration, which is that you, you test something by seeing whether it fits coherently in with other things. Um, you know, think of like doing a crossword puzzle. Uh, you know, do you determine the, the answers to the downs by the answers to the crosses, or do you determine the answers to the crosses by the answers to the downs? Well, it's some of each. Uh, you know, you fill in the, as much of the downs as makes sense to you, and much of the, as much of the crosses that makes sense to you, and then you try and, um, and use each one to uh, fill the other. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that's a way of minimizing uh, arbitrariness. Well, I mentioned earlier that there's this tradition that's called the eudaimonic tradition. Uh, and Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, uh, Scholastic, like Aquinas, and so forth, were um, all part of this uh, tradition that tried to base ethics on means and analysis. If you read uh, these guys, um, and a lot of them sound very praxeological. I mean, the early, the early Platonic dialogues are all about the implications of the fact that action is a matter of applying means to ends, and what does that imply? Uh, and the first, uh, you know, uh, the first sentence of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics is, you know, every action aims at an end. And then he says, you know, in some cases the action is part of the end, in some cases it isn't. You know, it's this constitutive instrumental uh, distinction. Uh, and what these philosophers believed was that everyone has one ultimate end, uh, an ultimate overarching end in which all their other ends fit, and that we can show that something is a moral duty by showing that it's an essential part, an essential constitutive means to this overall end. But how do we go about showing that we all share this uh, you know, when I say we share it, I don't mean that there's some end that we all mutually share. But I mean that each person has, you know, a, each person has a single end uh, of of the same kind. Now Mises would have been very skeptical of this. Mises would have said, well, other than you know something like relief from uneasiness, there isn't any sense in which we all share an end. So why did the Greek philosophers think that we all share? Now, that, that every person has an ultimate end, a single overarching end into which all our, uh, our other actions somehow are supposed to fit. Uh, why couldn't we just have a bunch of ends, period? We've just got a bunch of ultimate ends, and no one of them is, you know, includes any of the others. They just, they're just there. Well, suppose that were the case. Suppose that I just have a bunch of ends. Well, what happens when they conflict? How do I go about choosing them among them? You know, suppose, you know, let's... Let's simplify. Suppose I have only two goals in life. Uh, ice cream and fame. These are my two goals. Um, well, as long as they don't conflict, I'm fine. You know, I can enter ice cream eating contests and thus try to get fame that way and I'm getting ice cream at the same time and so forth. But, you know, there might be cases where these two goals would come into conflict. Cases where, for example, you know, there's ice cream this way and over this way, I have a chance either to save or to kill the president or something. And since all I care about is fame, it doesn't really matter which of them I do. Just you know, whichever one, you know, whichever one would be the you know, most most fame making at the time. But anyway, the president's over there, and the ice cream is over this way. Uh, so I have to choose. Well, then I, I would have to engage in deliberation. I'd have to try and decide which of these uh, goals to pursue. Well, deliberation is an end directed activity. It's an action. It's the application of, uh, of means to ends. What is my end? What is the end to which deliberating between fame and ice cream is the means? Well, the end can't be ice cream all by itself, because in that case I wouldn't have to deliberate. I'd just run off to the left. And it can't be, the end can't be fame, because in that case I would just run off to the right. It can't be the conjunction of them, because in this case the conjunction of them is not available. Now I have to choose. Um, so what is it? Something like you know, satisfying as much of what I want or as most important of what I want as possible. Some sort of overarching end like that. The very fact of deliberating between two ends shows that I have a third end. 
It's not a third, it's not a third end, you know, just like the other two. It's some kind of combo end. It's, it's, uh, you know, satisfying my preferences as much as possible. Something like that is the overall, uh, the overall end into which these other things fit. So, the Greek philosophers thought that the fact that we deliberate between different ends shows that we have the overarching end of having something like the maximum compossible realization of our ends or something. Uh, and that's the thing that they called happiness. But again, they didn't mean it purely as a subjective mental state. Uh, well, some of them thought it was, but most of them didn't. By happiness, they just meant something like, you know, the ultimate satisfaction of your, of your preferences or as many of them as, as, as possible, whatever they are. Well, why didn't they think that this was a psychological state? As I mentioned, some of them did. Epicurus, for example, thought that this was the psychological state of pleasure. Uh, although, given what Epicurus meant by pleasure, uh, you know, by pleasure he really meant the absence of pain rather than you know, actually any kind of fun. Uh, you know, we sometimes associate Epicureanism with, uh, you know, rolling around in food and drink, but uh, you know, Ep the Epicureans actually, Epicurus himself said, all I need is a little crust of bread and that's all I need. It was the Romans really thought, well, no, we need to read Aries Epicureanism to a, a higher culinary level. Um, and Mises, as I said, sometimes talks as though to the extent that we have an ultimate end, it's the relief of felt uneasiness. Now, it's a little hard to know whether, whether Mises means this is a psychological state or not, because Mises often says, look, uh, there's a sense in which eudaimonism or hedonism is true, but only formally. There isn't any concrete goal that we all share. It's just that, uh, it's just that something like preference satisfaction. It's just formally, that, in that sense, there's an ultimate goal. But sometimes he nevertheless talks as though we have, have a feeling of uneasiness and that, uh, and that uh, action is, the point of action is to get rid of this feeling of uneasiness. You've always got a hunger or a thirst or an itch or some sort of unpleasant feeling of lack. So it's not clear whether Mises is really committed to this psychological claim or not, but it sometimes sounds like he is. Well, why do the Greeks by and large think this wasn't right? Well, think of the following kind of example. Suppose I buy life insurance. Life buying life insurance is presumably a means to an end. It's not buying life insurance just because it's so much fun to buy life insurance. It's a means to an end. What's the end? Well, it seems as though uh, here's here's my action of buying life insurance. <coughs> And it seems as though the means, this is a means to the end of, uh, my loved one's doing well after I'm dead. And that might not be an ultimate end, that might be a means to something further, but at least it seems as though uh, this is a means to this. But suppose you think that everything you do is a means to some psychological state of yours, either a feeling of pleasure or a feeling of relieving your uneasiness or something like that. Well, if I'm dead, then I'm not going to be around here to get any pleasure from this. Uh, now you might think, well, maybe I'm hanging around you know, as, a, <coughs> as a disembodied spirit and watching my loved ones doing well after I'm dead and I'm getting a feeling of pleasure from that. You might think that, but it doesn't seem as though you have to think that in order for it to make sense for you to buy life insurance. Even people who don't believe in an afterlife, or people who believe in an afterlife but don't think they're going to be hanging around watching, they're going to be off doing something else, still buy life insurance. So it seems as though buying life insurance isn't a means to pleasure in the future. You might say, well, yeah, but buying life insurance gives you pleasure now. Because now, life buying life insurance causes you to have the thought or belief that your loved ones will do well after you're dead. And that thought or belief causes pleasure. So, so here's the moment of death. And you might say, well, then the pleasure that this is aimed at is not a pleasure in the future after you're dead. It's a present pleasure you get from the thought or belief. Ah, I bought life insurance. My family's okay. However, 
Although buying life insurance could be a means to this pleasure, the, uh, the question is, is buying life insurance also a means to this or not? Because if it's a means to this, this can't be a means to pleasure. So if your only reason for buying life insurance is you want to get this pleasure here, if that's your only reason, then you really don't value this at all. You don't care, you don't, you don't give a darn about this. And of course, if that's true, then suppose someone says, well, here I'm going to offer you the following choice. You can either buy this life insurance policy for $100, or you can buy this magic pill for $50. The magic pill will cause you to have the thought or belief that you've bought life insurance, and therefore that your loved ones will do well. So, do you want the life insurance for $100, or do you want the magic pill for 50 Now, if it's really true that the only reason you buy life insurance is to get this thought and the accompanying pleasure, uh, then it seems as though you'd have no reason to choose life insurance over the pill if the pill is cheaper. But if you would turn down the pill and say, no, I don't just want to think my loved ones are doing well, I want them really to do well after I'm dead, then the Greek philosophers would say, because they gave some examples similar to this, uh, they would say, aha, that shows that we do care about things that are not either pleasures or means to pleasure. And so that's why they took happiness to mean something objective. Uh, and so Aristotle thinks, for example, your happiness can be affected by what happens after you're dead. And again, by happiness, it doesn't mean your mental states. It just means the success of your life as a whole can be affected in part by you know, whether your various projects succeed or fail after you're dead. Uh, now, I think someone, you know, someone who thinks, no, everything we do is motivated by pleasure might say, ah, but you're not just taking pleasure in the thought or belief that they're going to do well. You're taking pleasure in the fact that they're going to do well. That's a possible answer, but uh, you know, maybe you can take pleasure now in a future fact. But unless you believe in backwards causation, that can't be because the future fact causes your present pleasure. And so therefore, you know, it's not clear whether the future fact can really be a means to your your present pleasure. But maybe someone could try to argue that it is, but if they do that, I think they're, they're broadening the scope of it uh, enough to make the Greeks uh, think that they've gotten in. Now, one of the questions that uh, you know, has divided uh, you know, many people is the question of whether rights, and this is a dispute in the, in the libertarian tradition, whether rights derive from utility. That is, uh, is, is the reason that we have rights or the reason that we should respect people's rights, is that solely because of the beneficial social consequences of a system of rights? Or do these rights have some kind of value in and of themselves? Now, Mises thought that the sole value uh, of rights ultimately depended on the social consequences. The value of rights is it enables us to coordinate our actions in a, and not come into conflict in a way that, en that enables us to engage in social cooperation and out of this we get peace and prosperity, which most people want. Uh, but Mises didn't think that there was any inherent value. I mean, he certainly you know, emotionally felt strongly about uh, rights, but he thought, and thought that you know, he needed uh, society needed a strong commitment to rights, but ultimately the justification he would give for this kind of commitment to rights is that it leads to beneficial social consequences. Rothbard disagrees. Rothbard thinks certainly, you know, it is a good thing about rights that they lead to beneficial social consequences. You know, hooray for that. But that's not the sole story as to why they're valuable. Uh, it, uh, there's just inherently uh, a duty uh, to uh, respect people's rights. People just have a kind of sacred, inherent uh, dignity or value. Uh, uh, why, um, uh, you know, why might someone hold one view or the other? Well, an argument that Rothbard gives against utilitarian approaches to rights is that the, utilitarian, the utilitarian's commitment to rights is likely to be unstable. 
Uh, because if you really think that rights aren't valuable in themselves, but only because they have beneficial consequences, then you're always going to be open to the argument, look, here's a shortcut. Here's a way we can promote beneficial social consequences uh, without, you know, without respecting rights. Uh, and if the only reason you care about rights is for the consequences, well then, you know, you're always going to be open to the argument. You know, if you're always doing cost-benefit analysis, someone can always give you a reason uh, to override rights. So that's one reason to worry about utilitarianism. And that's an argument, well, not just an argument Rothbard gives, but many moral philosophers have worried that a utilitarian's commitment to moral principles is going to be unstable. Now, one answer that consequentialists or utilitarians often give, and that Mises himself to some extent gives, is that you're not going to get the good results you want out of these moral principles unless you really are com pretty strongly committed to them. If you treat the rules as just rules of thumb to be discarded as soon as you see a possible opportunity, then, you're, then they're not going to be reliable. They're only reliable if you have a pretty strong commitment to them. And this view is called indirect consequentialism, where the idea is that you don't choose your particular actions on the basis of, will this particular action most promote the best consequences? Instead, you say, what general principles by and large promote the best consequences, and then if sticking consistently to them is one of the things that tends to promote those consequences, you should stick consistently to them. But one of the worries people have had about this is, well, uh, you know, does this really make sense? Can I really take this attitude? Uh, think about the distinction between, um, uh, between the utilitarian and the non-utilitarian this way. Remember the distinction between consumers' goods and producers' goods, or uh, first-order goods versus goods of higher order, um, where a, a first-order good or a consumer's good is one you want for itself. You, that's the ultimate thing you're trying to get. Whereas a good of higher order, a producer's good, is one you want because it can be used to produce these other goods down the line. So the real distinction between the utilitarian and the non-utilitarian is the utilitarian thinks morality is solely a producer's good, or solely a good of higher order. There's the whole value of morality comes from the fact, or the whole value of, in this particular case of you know, rights, respecting rights, which is part of morality, but not the whole of it. Uh, the whole value of respecting rights comes from its being a producer's good that produces these first order goods like peace and prosperity. Or maybe those aren't first order goods, maybe those are in turn goods, but anyway, it, it itself is a producer's good. Whereas non-utilitarians think that morality is, at least to some extent, a consumer's good or a first order good. It's a good worth having for its own sake. Now, the indirect consequentialist is in effect saying that you will get better results in the long run if you treat morality as though it were a first order good, as though it were a good for its own sake, even though it isn't. But the question is whether that's a coherent attitude to have. Uh, you know, suppose, I, suppose I'm a good utilitarian and I'm convinced by this argument that I won't get the good results I want unless I commit myself to these moral principles as though I valued them for their own sake. So I do. I say, I hereby commit myself to these principles. Well, have I really done it or not? If I have, then the argument is, well, I'm not a utilitarian anymore. I accepted the utilitarian argument for turning myself into a non-utilitarian. But now I've undertaken a genuine commitment to these goods for their own sake. And so, Although my reason for initially doing that was a utilitarian one, I've now kicked away the ladder after I climbed up it, and I've now become a non-utilitarian. On the other hand, if I'm still a utilitarian, and I'm still sort of whispering in the background, well, the only reason for this commitment is that it tends to get me better results in the long run, then I don't really have the commitment. At least that's the worry that people have had. Uh, let me close, close with just raising one further issue. What is the connection between rights and utility? You could hold on the one hand that rights depend solely and completely on utility, that the only point of rights is their beneficial consequences. And that seems to have been Mises' view. On the other hand, you could say that, uh, that the value of rights doesn't depend on utility at all. The utility is just gravy or frosting, uh, but that, in fact, uh, rights would be justified regardless of whether uh, they had good results. And it's just our good luck that the things we're morally obligated to do turn out actually to have beneficial consequences. 
hooray, but we just lucked out. And the utilitarians often say, well, that's awfully convenient. You know, isn't it odd that those who think that, uh, that these are genuine rights, you know, for example, uh, a utilitarian libertarian might say, well, look, you Rothbardians think that they, these rights are basic and inherent and, and so forth and would be justified even if they didn't lead to social, beneficial social consequences. But isn't it odd that you also think they do lead to beneficial social consequences? Isn't that a happy coincidence? Uh, you know, uh, you know, doesn't this show that really some utilitarian considerations are, are playing a role? Well, one possible uh, answer is you might think that uh, to take this ethical internalism seriously, to think that you can't, uh, you can't uh, t tell someone that they have a duty uh, unless they somehow they can be motivated to have it, that might mean that somehow we can't really make sense of of any value except insofar as we see them as all fitting together into some kind of coherent overall system. And that might mean that you, you, it doesn't make sense to think you can fully settle the content of justice independent of the content of other values. And that might mean that utility plays some role in determining the content of justice. However, that wouldn't get you utilitarianism because then justice would also play a role in determining the content of, of the other values. Uh, but that's just a, a possible suggestion to think about. Okay, questions? Yes? Uh, why is morality a constituent means to the ultimate? Um, well, that's a long story as to where the various different you know, philosophers thought that. Different ones had different, had, uh, different arguments. Uh, but uh, they, um, uh, you know, at least many of them thought that uh, the only way we could make sense of our ultimate end is we try and make it more specific and coherent is to think of it as the end of rational beings and that rational beings have to deal with one another through reason and persuasion uh, and so on. So they try to get, you know, so that nothing would count as achieving our, a rational life unless it involves certain kinds of interactions with other people. But that's, you know, it's a very short answer. Yes? Well, um, if you think that um, if you think that there's an ultimate end you're committed to, and that refraining from theft and so on is a constitutive means to that, then you know, then the Greek philosophers would say, well, then there's your objective uh, morality. It's not up to you whether you have this ultimate end. It's just part of the nature of human agency. It's not up to you that refraining from theft is is part of that ultimate end. That I think you can show you by argument that that somehow you're committed to that as, as part of the end. And so in that case then, uh, although it's not, you know, it's not somehow some sort of external intrinsic, you know, thing written in stone independent of you, nevertheless it's part of your own commitments. You find a commitment, you know, your own agency contains with it, within it a commitment you can't get rid of to respect people's rights, and so that's objective enough for, for them. I mean, with Plato, it's a little more complicated because for Plato, you know, there is sort of an objective good out there with a capital G, um, but that's a long story. Yes, Dan. Yeah, I mean that that might be true. The uh, all the example has to show is that we care about some we care to some extent about something uh, as an ultimate goal other than our own uh, subjective states. I mean, all these guys thought that pleasure was part of the ultimate goal. Well, when you go back to the example of that contains both the value for the realistic condition and mm -hmm. the, the pleasure that you observed it, it's not necessarily clear which one is driving that choice. 
given that they're both subject to, uh, well, mm -hmm. or, uh, Yeah, but you can, I mean, you can imagine it in your own case, and you can imagine, you know, how you would decide. In any case, even if, in fact, everyone who bought, ever bought life insurance did it, you know, for this reason rather than this one, I think that that would be a, a phamological absurdity, but it's not a practicological absurdity. Nevertheless, even if this were the case, in fact, there's no praxeological contradiction in this. Uh, and so praxeology cannot guarantee us that the only goal we ever have is relieving our own felt uneasiness understood as a psychological state. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, even if this turned out to be factually wrong, it, uh, you know, it would still be consistent with praxeology. So praxeology doesn't commit us to, to some sort of uh, hedonism. Yeah, David. I think one pre reason some people might want to resist that idea is they don't want our moral rights to somehow be hostage to you know, contingent empirical facts. But if praxeology is right, then the economic facts are not contingent empirical facts. They're, you know, they're part of the whole conceptual structure, and so no worries made. If what is the root? Yeah. Yeah, and the, the idea. Of, yeah, so the idea is the, the happiness itself would not be a criticizable end, but happiness itself is you know, sort of a vague and generic thing, and when and you know, del and further deliberation isn't just about causal means to it, but constitutive means to it, which is filling that in and making it more specific. And you can criticize particular specifications of the general end. So yeah, so you can crit criticize you know at least 99.99999 percent of the stuff you wanted to criticize and. That's what we want. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned <clears throat> the indirect consequences as a defense for the utilitarian principle. Wouldn't that break down when you came to short-term uh, time frames, such as if someone uh, has terminal illness, what would cause them to want to use morality because you know they're never going to receive anything in response? Yeah, well, that's one of the that's one of the problems for the interconsequentialist view is that. If you think the reason the reason to forego you know short-term wrongdoing is to gain you know some long-term benefit, then in cases where you know you're about to die, then you've got no reason not to uh, go for the short-term wrongdoing. And so that's another sense in which uh, I think the the indirect consequentialism can't uh, uh, you know can't give morality the kind of stability that they think they have. And they might say, well, you just committed yourself. You know, for utilitarian reasons, so hard to the moral principles that you keep going in that case. And I think, well, all right, but in that case, then what you did was you turned yourself into a non-utilitarian. Okay, time for one more question, I think. Dan. What do you think about Kirsten's uh, coordination as a social welfare? Um, it's one of the good things, uh, but not the only one. Okay, thank you.